Okay, so we're back for the third short recording for week one in Moon Hua Dung Tech seminar on, pub, on cultural policy. And you will remember that in the previous session we looked at a number of examples of what could be considered culture and I asked you to think about what those things were and maybe how they fit we will be talking about those pictures next week but for now let's go ahead and move a little bit deeper into the question of culture and to do that we're going to go back over into the CTL to look at some things that are there I'm going to enter the classroom a little bit differently this time okay so you've logged in you've got your classroom choices we go over here to moon watch junk check and we enter and we can see things here and it's not in the schedule we want so I'm just going to go ahead and click on Haksap Jario Shil on the suitcase and there's a bunch of things there from the first one welcome to class it talks very briefly about the e-board I call it the e-board electronic board the CTL the Haksap Jario Shil um, please take a look at that then there's the name cards I mentioned previously there's a couple of short readings I mentioned previously. Fine, that's not my focus for this mini lecture. We have something on defining public policy that we'll come to in about 10 minutes. And at the very top, as the time I record this, it talks about changing from culture to creative. This reading is our key point in our next class our face-to-face -face class I want you to look at this before next class please read it try to read it you are welcome to use Google Translate or Papago or whatever to help you in your reading and there will be more to follow but for our first class face-to-face -face, we have a relatively short reading but we're also going to review everything that we did this class so in our classes usually somebody will take notes and that note uh, review of the last class will take 15 minutes maybe uh, this particular class we have a lot more things to do May 9 we need to develop our calendar for the future etc so only a short reading for next time but for this class this recorded lecture we have two readings and first we're going to start with defining culture okay so what you can see is that the Haksap Jario is uh, out of sequence and I will send you messages through the cacao to tell you to remind you what you should be ready for in our next class all right so here People argue about what is culture. The definition of culture is tough. The attached page shows a wide variety, excuse me, of definitions. A wide variety of definitions. We can also talk about high culture and low culture, sometimes called highbrow and lowbrow. And I introduced that in the last uh, mini lecture when I pointed to uh, bowling and something a lot of people would call lowbrow and I pointed to the classic culture things like opera ballet which are traditional high culture now for this particular uh, reading I have attached it both as a MS Word doc file and as a PDF file I'm going to open the PDF file and we could click on this and open it but I already have it on my computer if I can just find it oops maybe I can't it's not there ah oh, here we go culture culture not the Wikipedia defining culture here we go
Now, this particular... Oh, I hate when it does that. This particular uh, collection of information is from a number of places, basically mostly captured online. And I'm not citing anything, it's just a bunch of thoughts. There is no one right answer. I'm not asking you to define culture because as soon as you give a precise definition, somebody will argue with it. Part of our role in this class when we're talking about cultural policy or culture policy, part of our job is recognizing that there are many competing definitions and people fight to protect their idea what is culture. So let's take a look. Here is a nice broad definition that I'm going to use in another place in our class. The culture of society comprises, is, is made from the shared values, what I think is important, understanding, you and I agree, assumptions, I think must be like this, and goals, what I hope to get, that are learned from earlier generations, from our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers that are adopted by present members of society, we decide this is culture, and is passed on to our children and grandchildren, our succeeding generations. Now, something could start now and be passed on. Something could be starting now, but abandoned. So, if you know about, for example, some 1970s culture ideas. Some of those things are gone. Not too many men value long hair, but still we find a few. But it's not really the culture of young people today. So culture can be from the past until now. It can be past and, and basically kind of abandoned now, but we recognize that my grandfather thought this. And it can be things that are passed on. Uh, here's an example. Trot music. Korean trot. Uh, my wife's father. That's mostly only what he listened to. Now my wife is listening to it more and more. Actually, I, I don't like trot. But uh, what's funny is that a lot of small children who spend time with their grandparents have adopted trot. And we can see on KBS these five-year-old kids singing songs from the 1950s. Will they keep it? Will those children give it up? I don't know. But this is an example of someone has decided that throat is culture. But really it comes from the 1950s, right? There wasn't throat in 1930s. It was a little bit different. So that's one definition. Here's another definition. Culture unites people of a single society together unites us together through shared beliefs, traditions, and expectations. Expectation. What I think someone should do. So, children should bow to old people? I expect that is true. Is it a cultural tradition? Sure it is. But it's what I now expect children to do. If I give my daughter money, I might give her money with one hand. Oops, you can't see that. I might give her money with one hand. I expect her to take it with two hands. And if she doesn't, if she reaches out with one hand, I pull the money back. Because she lives in Korea. And she works with Koreans all the time. And she should remember this kind of culture, this kind of manners, is that you accept gift with two hands. Culture unites people of a single society together through shared beliefs, traditions, and expectations. The two basic types of culture are material, and which is physical things, and, oh, this is not working, material, tangible things, physical things, produced by society that we introduced before, and non-material culture. 
which we can say is intangible things okay, produced by society. So, uh, non-material could be uh, the steps to a dance. The steps to a dance. Do you remember it? You can, you can make a video, and the video will be tangible. But the actual steps in a dance is not a physical thing. So in the fields of anthropology and sociology, and I didn't, I didn't uh, look up those words, sahe, hak, and I don't know what anthropology is. Culture refers to the sum of human beings' life ways. Their behavior, beliefs, feelings, thought, it, it connotes, it suggests everything that is acquired by people as social beings. Okay, so how to cook rice uh, does your mother and your wife cook rice the same way um, maybe not more generally not just in the narrow sciences looking at a general dictionary we might find that Culture is the arts, beliefs, customs, institutions, and other products of human work and thought. Considered as a whole, considered as a unit, especially thinking about a particular group or a particular time. Edwardian culture, the culture of England 1910-1920, when Edward was king, or Japanese culture. Now this is the kind of culture that the common person would think about. Okay? Option B. These arts, beliefs, and other products considered with respect to a particular subject or mode of expression. So, for example, musical culture or oral culture, meaning spoken culture, only by speaking. A uh, third option here would be a set of predominating attitude. Predominant means uh, most powerful, most strong, almost everybody agrees that is. A set of predominating attitudes, I think this is good, and behavior that characterizes a group or organization. Somebody could say, uh, Koreans are very shy. The world thinks Koreans are shy. Actually, that's not true. The world thinks that Koreans are somewhat pushy. The world thinks that Japanese are very shy and humble. I didn't say it's right. It's the main attitudes, what people think. Or it could be the main behavior, the way some people act. And we accept that as being the main way. So those are some ideas about culture are a different kind of definitions from a different dictionary could be artistic and intellectual pursuits and products. Pursuit means things I chase after and products. So, for example, uh, I am a painter and I paint. Maybe I throw all my paintings away because they're not good enough for me. So maybe there's no product. But I am pursuing, I am chasing this goal of the beautiful, perfect painting. So that would be an intellectual pursuit or an artistic pursuit. Second, a quality of enlightenment or refinement. We think people have very good manners. People are well cultured. They know how to dress. They speak in a very high form. They enjoy the opera and the symphony. Okay, And we somehow believe that that is a high form of society. A quality of enlightenment or refinement coming from an acquaintance with, it means I, I know somewhat, not perfectly, and a concern for, I worry about, what is generally regarded as excellent. What people think of as being excellent in arts, letters, manners, etc. So maybe I'm not the best, but I try to be. 
So when I drink tea, I drink tea with my little finger out because we understand that drinking tea should be with two fingers, one thumb, and this finger is outside the ring and this finger is sticking out and that is the proper way to drink tea. Now me, I'm a coffee guy. This cup, we saw it in the previous video, but this is a coffee mug and it's heavy, so drinking with two fingers and one finger touching the cup and one finger straight out, it's kind of hard with a heavy cup. So it's a quality of enlightenment or refinement. We look at somebody and we say they are cultural. Third choice is development or improvement of the mind by education or training. So if we think about the Shela era, Shela today, the Huarang were famous as warriors, as fighters, but they were also famous for their study and pursuit of the highest culture. They were highly cultured as well as soldiers. Number four, the sum total of ways of living. The sum total, all collection, all together, the ways of living collected, built up by a group of human beings and transmitted from one generation to the other. So, a way of life, a way of doing. Uh, Koreans lived in villages where the back of the village was towards the mountain, the front of the village was the way you entered. This kind of style was considered to be a Korean village. Uh, some other cultures maybe didn't care or they built the point, the front of the village in a different direction. Number five, a particular form or stage of civilization, such as for a nation or a period. Example, Greek culture. If the Greeks do something today, that's not really what we think of as Greek culture. We usually think of Greek culture as before the Roman times, before uh, for 300 BC. So before 300 BC, we think of Achilles and the classic Greek stories as being Greek culture. But of course there are Greeks today, living in Greece today, who still drink some of the old Greek style drinks and still eat some of the old classic Greek kind of food. So we have to be careful. Maybe we need to say classic Greek culture or ancient Greek culture. Okay, a particular form or stage of civilization. So if we say Roman, we don't really mean people in Rome today. We're thinking about that time from maybe 200 BC until, what, 780? Uh, Shila culture, being different from uh, Goryeo culture. Uh, number six, the behaviors and beliefs that are characteristic, that, that that are what we expect of a particular social, ethnic, or age group. The youth culture, the drug culture. Okay. So not all American culture, but the flower children, the hippies of the 1960s and early 1970s in America. Definitely not the main part of America, but a particular social, ethnic, or age group. Okay, a third collection of definitions for culture. From sociology, the total of the inherited beliefs, ideas, beliefs, values, and knowledge which constitute the shared basis of social action. Pretty much the same as before, but it refers to social action, meaning people live their life. They do things in groups because of these ideas. In anthropology and ethnology, which is the study of ethnic groups, kind of like race, the total range of activities and ideas of a group of people. All the activities and ideas of a group of people with shared traditions. And these traditions are transmitted, sent from one to the other, and reinforced, we, you should do this because we think so, by members of the group. Example, the Mayan culture. Anthropology and ethnology, a particular civilization at a particular period. Example, the Mayan culture. Example, the Shela culture. Example, the Bekje culture. In art, 
Culture refers to the artistic and social pursuits, expressions, and taste valued by society or class, as in the arts, manners, dress, etc. So, for example, culture for painters might refer to a particular era. He is very much involved in the impressionistic culture or uh, Rembrandt culture. Okay, we talk about groups of people and the idea that it's good. Uh, do, does does a painting need to look like reality? If you're a cubist, you say no. If you're impressionist, you say no. It doesn't need to look like a photograph. It doesn't need to look like reality. It needs to be art. Point five: the enlightenment or refinement resulting from these pursuits. So if you are chasing culture and you then get culture, that would be the enlightenment or refinement. That somehow you are better than the common people because you have culture. And again, we can often think about culture in this case. Culture is kind of sort of like manners, an understanding of the good way to eat, um, are there things that you should or shouldn't do when you eat food in Korea? And is that different than the way to eat food in America? Well, yes, it is. And so, if you eat food the wrong way, if you eat it American way in Korea or Korean way in America, people look at you funny. As one example, I like to drink when I eat. I like to eat many things together. In American style, eating your plate or serving will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things at the same time. Now, if you eat in a restaurant, they'll bring a few things one by one. First you get the soup, then you get the salad, or is it the other way? I forget. Uh, then you will get a main course and probably a few side dishes with it. Now in, in the West, main course is probably meat or fish or bird, poultry. But in Korea, in Asia, in many countries, the main course feels like it's rice, right? And then everything else is side dishes. So there's a, there's a, a mind that's different, an attitude that's different. And so, uh, when do you drink? Well, in Korea, you usually don't drink until after. And if you go to the gogi jeep, you eat so much meat. And then they bring the rice and the denjang, the soup. And you might be drinking uh, alcohol with your meat, but if you're not drinking alcohol, you're probably not drinking maybe, maybe some soda. But in U.S., you would be expected to drink as you eat. Have a bite, put your fork down, maybe talk, have a drink of wine, put your cup down, pick up your knife and fork, pick up the next food, right? But in Korea, you tend to eat gogi, eat gogi, eat gogi, eat gogi. Now, that's different from if you go to the big restaurant where you have hanshik and there are 17 side dishes on the table, right? Then you take a look at this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You have a, a bite of rice, a bite of panchan, a bite of rice, a bite of panchan, right? And Step by step. You don't just eat rice or just don't eat panchan. A little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. So, depending on, even in Korea, depending on what you eat or what social class you are in, might decide what is good culture for eating. Eating culture. Number six, the last one, sociology. The attitudes, feelings, values, and behavior that characterize, that, that is sample of the society, typical, and inform society, tell society what's good or bad, as a whole or any social group within it. Okay, so the feelings, the attitudes, the values, I think it's good, and behavior that we think of when we think of a culture, a society, a group of people. For example, yob culture. In UK, yob is slang, it means loutish, uncultured person, someone with no manners. Hey, you know what? That's a new word for me. 
I'm from America. I never heard of Yob. I think I heard somebody say it a long time ago, and I knew that I didn't know what Yob is. But now I know that in the UK, you say someone's a Yob, means they have no culture, no manners. Okay, they're a lout. They behave with no manners. All right, so we're getting close to our time for this third recording, because our second recording was long. But we have gone through this idea of defining culture. We can close this. All right, so there are so many definitions of culture. I'm not going to ask you to give me a precise definition of culture, but you need to have an idea in your mind so that when you talk about culture, if somebody says, well, why? Why do you think so? You can explain it partly based on the definition in your head. Okay. And it says we can talk about high culture and low culture. High culture is usually the things we think of with the very rich, the elite who do their high refined things. Uh, the, chap the, the Chinese empress from 300 years ago who had fingernails that were so long and so she had a cover to go over her fingernail and this was a way to show that she doesn't have to work. If she had to work, her fingernails would break, right? So someone who is highly refined in that sense, in that time, didn't have to work. They had long fingernails to prove they didn't have to work. And yes, I know, uh, in Korea, even not that long ago, especially at the final stages of the Joseon era, there were lots of elites who grew their fingernails long because they only did paperwork and they could hold a pen without they could hold a pen without damaging their fingernails. All right, so that's defining culture. We're going to pop into this next one, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Defining public policy. Well, you're Hang Jung Jung Chek students, right? You understand policy, okay? And we can um, think of it in the simplest way as accepted rules or guidelines. Or maybe it's only aims of what we hope to accomplish, what we hope to happen, with some kind of roughly defined method. We may not decide exactly how to do it, but we have a policy that something is good. Something should be. People should do this. Even if we haven't... You know, people should vote. It's a policy that people should vote. Everyone who is old enough and hasn't violated major crimes, they should vote. That's our policy. Now, how we make it happen is when we start going from big policy into narrower, 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 narrower ways of doing. Public policy can be defined in many ways. For example, I have four public administration dictionaries in my office. They all define it differently. So I happen to like the Chandler and Plano dictionary that I have. It explains things fully. And that uh, two page it's like basically one page but broken on two pages, is attached. You can open it. This one I'm going to open this way. Here's the cover of the book. You can see it's quite beat up. It's old. And public policy the start of the first page. Public policy is basically strategic use of resources to alleviate national problems or governmental concerns. I will use that quote somewhere else. You heard it 15 minutes ago. Okay, then it says it takes four forms. Da -da 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 -da. So here's the full thing. Significance. And then the next section, responsible party sex system. That's not what we need. Close that. So it attaches the full version, but it's really not a complete public policy. First of all, it's kind of old. That book is from 1986, I think. 88. Um, 
and we can imagine some ideas for policies that are less altruistic. Altruism means uh, thinking only the best, thinking only good things for to help people. All right. So we can imagine things that are less altruistic. And the four key points are, first of all, the main one, strategic use of resources to alleviate national problems or governmental concerns. Public policy takes four forms, according to Plano and uh, Chandler and Plano. First is regulatory policy that says what you cannot do, basically. Or it says you need a license to do that. Number two is redistributive. Redistributive. But it's, but it's pronounced it's really hard. Redistributive policy. This is Robin Hood. I take from the rich and I give to the poor. Actually, redistributive could be the reverse, though. It could be I take from the poor and I give to the rich. Does anyone think that the Republican Party in the United States thinks like this? That we give everything to the big companies and don't care about the poor people? We tax the poor people, but the rich people have very low taxes? No, I didn't say that. Regulatory policy, redistributive policy. Then the third one is distributive policy. And this is where government is worried about making sure that everybody has a chance. Everybody gets a shot. Everybody is equal to these opportunities, to these resources. And finally, number four, constituent policy. And in a way, this is really kind of a political policy. Constituent is the word we use to refer to people who the politician represents. If you are the politician for, uh, if you are the National Assemblyman for Daegu A, or something like that, then the people who live in Daegu A who can vote, they're your constituents. Well, everybody who lives in a government area who are citizens are constituents. And maybe foreigners are constituents. We have different ideas. Uh, constituent policy serves the nation as a whole, or the city as a whole, if we look at cities, by protecting national security and by meeting the operating needs of government agencies. For example, we need to make money. We mint it. We print it. Or we hire another company to do it for us. And we hire workers in government to do government work. All right? This definition is quite traditional. So one of the big points we're going to talk about in this class is national promotion and soft power. And that's not here, because national promotion and soft power is relatively new concept. A relatively new concept. Not something we talk about much. Next week, we will talk about culture and how the language has changed on that. Let me just close this. And I can close this one and this one. Your assignment before next week is to think about these photos we looked at earlier. Right? How would you classify them? Would you classify them different than me? Do you recognize all of them? We're going to talk a little bit about, at the last of this class, understanding policy through a chart. Now we can find these, these images many places, and they're all a little bit different, but they discuss this kind of policy cycle. So we are using resources strategically. That means thinking long-term. What are the long-term problems in society and how do we address these long-term problems in a long-term way? Strategic use of resources to alleviate, to reduce, to cure society's problems. Or maybe they're not really society's problems. Society doesn't think so. But they are governmental concerns. The government's worried about it, even if society is not thinking about it. 
I also want to point out that it's not just societal problems, but it could be perceived societal problems. Perceived means I see it and I think so. What I see. P-E-R-C-E-I-V-E-D. And I'm going to shrink this so it all fits. There's the word for you. One more quote. And it jumped down here. Gotta make it smaller again. Ah, that's the problem. Didn't mean to get that. usually do 40, so we got to get this one smaller. And that's 36. Ah, come on, fix you! Anyway, we are at the end of our time here. I'm just fiddling with this so it will look good for you if you decide to look at this PowerPoint in the Jario, or it's going there soon. So, the policy process starts with identifying a problem or identifying a perceived problem. Okay? And then developing a policy. We can solve this problem if we make an idea, a rule like this. Okay, we're creating it. That's usually staff work. It could be inside the National Assembly or inside a ministry. Then it goes to adoption, which means the, the National Assembly accepts it and the president signs it, or that the minister inside the ministry signs it. Then we implement that policy. We actually do it. And then we evaluate, we assess, we examine it to find out if it's working, if it's not working, what did it do. We have a new policy and it has done this very well, but maybe it created a new problem. So the cycle continues. All right, so that's where we are for this class. And I'm going to stop here and ask you to prepare for next week's Saturday class where we will review this, make plans for coming weeks, Saturdays and additional classes, and continue. All right. Thank you very much. Turning off this. Bye-bye.